yes, even when I was a child, I could become so absorbed in what I was reading and the rest of the world was gone. And it is a really wonderful feeling. Well, I am super excited for today's conversation. We have Kristen Proby, who is not only a New York Times, USA Today, but also a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. So as we talk about in Hockey World, it's the hat trick of bestsellers. Uh, welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. <laughs> I love it. I might have hockey on the mind because I did record with a hockey guest earlier today, but uh, welcome to the show. What I want to do is, you know, I always find it fascinating the journey that somebody has and ending up in doing what they do and where they are today. So, you know, perhaps you could just give our listeners a little background about who you are and, and you know, what brought you to the point of being a best-selling author. And then we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, what you're doing today as an author. Sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Montana, a tiny little ski town here in Montana, uh, born and raised. And um, I've always been a writer since I was young. I should say I've always been a storyteller, um, as my parents, I'm sure, would tell you. And uh, so fiction has always been um, interesting to me. And I started reading romance novels when I was in high school, probably to my mother's chagrin. Um, and Creative writing became something I really loved in high school. And in my early 20s, I decided to start trying to write romance. Um, they were horrible in the beginning. And uh, it just took a lot of years of honing that craft and learning uh, what it really is to craft a story. And uh, in 2012, I published my first novel. Um, and we've been going ever since. Gangbusters. Amazing. So this was... This was in your DNA. This is really the path that you really kind of went out on, started on, and really never looked back from from what you. it sounds like. Well, writing was always a hobby for me for a long time. Uh, I worked in the medical field for quite a, well, about 15 years. Um, and, you know, life happens in between, right? There's weddings and things moving. But um, writing was always the constant for me. Um, and it was always a goal that I would be published. And I submitted to agents and editors for many years, then they all said, no, thank you, uh, which was fair. It probably wasn't that great at the time. Um, in 2012, I have a cousin who, speaking of DNA, I have a cousin who actually published, um, he self-published on Amazon. And I said, wait a second, how did you do that? And he was nice enough to show me how to do it. So I wrote um, my first book, Come Away With Me. And my whole goal was really, anybody other than my mother to read what I wrote. And um, it's since been downloaded 2 million times. So I think that has, Amazing. yeah. Amazing. So it, it sounds like, I mean, what, where did the inspiration come from? Because I mean, it sounds like it's something that you had been interested in from a very young age. Uh, but, you know, was there someone, something in your life that really led you down this path that you said, hey, I really want to be a writer? And I guess more specifically, uh, was it just what you read that led you down the romance genre or were there other things that work there? I think it really was what I was reading. I truly enjoy reading romance. It's what I read for fun. Um Nora Roberts is my favorite author, and I just really admire her career for sure. Uh, so I don't know that it was any one person or any one inspiration other than I just knew this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So you, you found what you loved and you, you did it, you refined it and you stuck with it. It sounds like I was really stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds, you sound like an entrepreneur to me. That's what you sound like. Very, not, not too dissimilar from kind of the entrepreneurial path or journey really. It truly is. This is a business. Uh, I run, I'm the CEO of a business, of a company, and um, I probably spend more of my day with um, administrative work and running a business and um, feeling inspired by what, how we're going to do even better this year than last year. Um, I do that more than I actually probably put in writing. <laughs> Well, it's a business. So let, let's talk about your career a little bit. You started your writing career with what was supposed to be a standalone, 
that ended up turning into an eight book series that, you know, from my understanding, really, you know, transformed your career. The With Me in Seattle series garnered a real huge fan base. Uh, but you recently released a new series, The Wild of Montana, going back to probably your your roots. What advice do you have for other authors who might be hesitant about taking something that's been, you know, a proven winner of interest and, and garner a lot of attention and, and going to a new place uh, with a with a new storyline, if you will? It can be scary. Uh, but I also think that we start to get stagnant when we write something for too long. Um, and so with me in Seattle, yes, the original series is nine books or eight books, but the actual series itself is 19 books. And after a while, readers start to say, wait a second, that's too many books. Like I, it's too daunting for me to go back and read 19 books to figure out what's happening, you know, now, even though they do all stand alone. Um, so I was actually really excited as an artist, but also as a reader to say, wait, we need to start something new um, that isn't connected to what I'm famous for. Um, and I use the term famous very loosely, but uh, it it was exciting for me. And actually, it wasn't very scary for me because I was just ready to move on to a whole new family in a whole new setting. So and I, I guess as just do it. Has that been a success? That's been a success for you? It has. The new series is doing very well. Yeah. yeah. Better than I, I I guess going back to your CEO role, I would assume it's probably very similar to looking at launching a new product or a new product line or a product offering. You have to do kind of an assessment if the marketplace would be there. Obviously, you have the creative juices to do that. And then the you know, the readers are going to be your best guess or best indication of whether it's a success or not. If it has the, you know, success of some of those previous series or does even better than those. Right. I would agree. Actually, we did almost a year of um, research to see where should my next series be set? What are readers buying? What are they enjoying? And um, that's definitely a huge part of my job is paying attention to the market. Um and so we did that for a long time. And then I spent about six months, not just writing that first book, but also deciding how are we going to market this book? What are we going to do differently for this series than what we've done before to make it a success? And um, thankfully it worked. <laughs> I would say it's probably attributed to, you know, doing that up, upfront research. Cause I think many times business owners, whether it be an author or releasing a series or like we said, releasing a new product, people have a tendency to just release it. You know, the uh, if you build it, they will come kind of mentality. And a lot of times that doesn't work. So I, I would attribute it to probably a lot of great research on the front end to knowing who your readers are and what they wanted and kind of filling that void for them. Yeah, thank you. I agree. So your books often feature a very, you know, a strong female character or characters. You know, what draws you to writing about these kind of characters? And are there, you know, real life experiences that you've had that kind of inspire or influence these characters as a result? I love writing about strong women because I want to write about women I would want to be friends with. Um, I want to write and because I spend a lot of time with these people. Uh, I want to write about women who um, I respect and I would want in my life if they were real. Uh, so that's the driving force behind that. I, I like them. I enjoy spending time with them. So uh, let's talk about that for a minute, because I, I think that that gets lost on a lot of people, what you just said, right? And, you know, you kind of glanced or glossed over it in terms of I spend a lot of time with these people. And I, I don't think uh, unless you're a writer in your you know, capacity or even maybe a little bit lower level, understanding what that means exactly. Right. Can you can you share with our with our listeners kind of what that means to you and what time is spent? Because I, I think that often gets overlooked. Sure. Uh, so when I'm writing a book, I spend several months with these people, but not just during the few hours a day that I get to sit down and write about them. They're talking to me constantly. I have scene ideas that come into my head while I'm having dinner, or 
if I'm out to my niece's choir concert, all of a sudden I hear a song and I think, oh, that would be great in this scene in the book that's coming up. They live with me 24 seven um, for a while I'm working on that project. And they certainly have, it makes me sound a little mentally ill, but it's, I'm really, you know, it's fine. It's done well for me. Um, they are just with me all the time. And um, it's certainly not a nine to five job. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I guess that's the art, art, you know, the artistic process, right? I mean, you want to develop this thing and you really want to put your all. Was this something that you felt very similarly growing up when you were on the other side of the book, meaning you were reading? Did did those stories really take uh, take to life with you? And that's really why that's resonated with you over this period of time? I think so. I think it's definitely something that is a almost an addiction for me. Even now, I read other people's work all the time and I will voraciously consume it. Like I want to read it until I get to the end of it. And I read quite quickly. And so, yes, even when I was a child, I could become so absorbed in what I was reading and the rest of the world was gone. And it is a really wonderful feeling. Yeah. So for you, if, 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 uh, if, the person you like to read, I, I think you said Nora Roberts earlier, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if she had a 19 book plus series, that wouldn't be a deterrent for you, it sounds like. I would blow through them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, so you said you started as a self-published author, right? And then I believe you ended up signing at some point a with a traditional publisher, and now you're self-publishing again, yeah. right? For, for those that might be thinking of, you know, going down this route and think that they have a, a gift of, of writing and storytelling like you, you know, what have been the challenges and rewards of each publishing route? Because I, I think this is something that gets debated and talked about very often in terms of going the traditional publishing route versus uh, self-publishing. And you've had the experience of kind of, dip, you know, being involved in both of those, if you yeah. will. Yes, they are very different. Um, I would say with self-publishing, you just know your book's going to get published and you have complete control over when it's going to be published and everything that goes into that from a cover to, to editing to marketing and everything else. Traditional publishing is great in that your books are likely to be in a bookstore, um, which in self-publishing, that's not as common. Um, And you have a lot of help as far as uh, you don't have to pay for your own. You don't have to make the investment up front for cover, editing, all the other things I mentioned. Um, so in self-publishing, that is all on the author from the get. Um, I can be sometimes five figures into an investment on a book before it ever is published. Uh, whereas if you're if you're publishing with a tradition with a traditional house, um, hopefully you get an advance up front. And you have no out-of-pocket expense. Um, that's the biggest difference for me. But I really love the control. Um, I am that entrepreneur. So I like the control. And I like having a say in every piece of the puzzle. But I also have to say, I learned so much. And I was traditionally published fairly early in my career. So I self-published in 2012. But by... Mid 2013, I had uh, I had a contract with Simon and Schuster, and they published uh, my first book with them in 2014. So it happened very quickly, um, and I feel like it was a gift to me that I learned from them so much so early, so that now later in my career, I have that foundation of knowledge. Right, and I mean, it's the big thing that you're giving up uh, with regard to the traditional publishing route, the that control uh, piece in terms of, you know, marketing, where it's going to be marketed? Are there other specific things that listeners should be aware of that they may not know because you only know what you know in terms of what's being given up in that process versus self-publishing? 
Sure. I mean, sometimes it can take years for a book to be published traditionally. So I may finish a book this year, but if I sell it to a publisher, it could take two or three years before it ever hits a shelf, um, which then means that in two or three years, I have to try to market that book. And I don't remember what it's about because I've since I've since written other books in the meantime. And, and right. as a creative person, that can be rough. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, honestly, is that you have no control over any kind of timeline. Um, also, they will assign editors to you. And sometimes that editor doesn't even read romance novels. So um, you don't have a say in who edits the book. And the good thing is, though, every editor that I had in New York, whether they loved romance or not, they all said, this is your book, though. You can, you can veto anything that I say here. It's your book at the end of the day. But also you need to revise all of this for us to publish. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a job. Just to dovetail what you were just saying, if they say you need to revise all of this, whatever this is, basically you're contractually obligated to do that, right? It's not something you can at that point say, hey, I, I don't want to do it. I think it's structurally and, you know, uh, you know, formatted, et cetera, and, and content is spot on. I, I don't really feel that these changes, you're kind of losing control over that creativity over that portion as well, right? To some degree. You absolutely do because you're contractually, they bought that, they own it. You no right. longer own that story. So um, they own it. They get to tell you how to write it. Wow. How, how have you seen, you know, the industry, your, your profession, you know, has gone through, I, I would say, a, a lot of change, you know, in, in your view, you know, how have you seen the industry evolve since you began writing back in 2012? It's been a massive change. Honestly, it's so different now than it used to be. Uh, and by that, I mean, when I published in 2012, there wasn't a lot of self-published authors. I would say less than 50 of us in the romance genre were self-publishing and successful at it. Um, and now, I mean, hundreds of books are released every week on Amazon. So um, the, it's grown hugely with um, just authors who are publishing, they're self-publishing, which, which is amazing. Um, the other thing is they've, Kindle has introduced um, Kindle Unlimited that was born a few years ago, and that's a very different take on how consumers take in their um, their books. Um, so the way that we're paid is completely different now. Um, readers have changed. Uh, some of the re new readers that are finding me were children when I first started writing. So um, now I'm having to decide how do I market to young 20 somethings and still make my books attractive to women who are in their forties and fifties who have been with me this whole time. Um, it's, it's been an interesting couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let's focus in a little bit on that, um, uh, change in compensation for a minute. Cause you touched on it, but I, I don't think the average person really understands what, what it means, right? You talked about Kindle Unlimited. You talked about the way you're compensated on that. So, I mean, traditionally, if a book's being sold by Amazon, for example, I, as the consumer, I go buy the book, uh, essentially, whatever that price point is, uh, I would imagine a good portion of that's going to you, a portion's going to Amazon for, for publishing it and hosting on the platform. Kindle Unlimited is a completely different uh, you know, beast, so to speak. And oh, can you explain how that works with, in, in, with regard to your compensation as an author? Because I, I think our listeners will find that quite interesting. Sure. So I'm going to back it up to if you just buy the book. Um, so if a book is priced at $2.99 for an ebook, you purchase it. 80, sorry, 70% of that goes to the author and, and Amazon keeps 30% for all the things that you mentioned. If you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription and that same book is offered in KU and you download it that way to read it, the author gets paid by how many page reads are read 
for that book. Amazon pays 0 0.004 cents per page that is read. So on a $2.99 book, my math is going to be a little weird. I don't do math really well. But if I'm making $2 for my $2.99 book, if you just purchase it, I want to say it's something like you only make, it's roughly $1.50 if you just read it in Kindle Unlimited. So for a long time, I was resistant to going into Kindle Unlimited because I had quite a following still on Apple and Barnes & Noble. Oh, and that's something I forgot to add. If you ha have your book in Kindle Unlimited, it is exclusive to Amazon. You cannot publish it on any other platform. Um, so for 10 years, I cultivated readers on those other platforms. Um, but Amazon is a force. And mm -hmm. I think we're also in an age of readers want to consume things very quickly. And they love, especially young readers, they love a subscription. Whether it's Netflix or Hulu or Kindle Unlimited, I want to pay one price a month and I want to consume everything that I, that I can for that one price every month. And I find for my genre, younger readers especially are they subscribe to Kindle Unlimited. So finding those younger readers on the other platforms was becoming harder and harder for me. And um, it just made sense for me to make the move into Kindle Unlimited to reach those readers who would not read me otherwise. Um, right. And so I made that business decision. So far, it's going well. I haven't had a ton of readers who only consume me on the other platforms reach out to me and say, I'm really disappointed. I can't find your book over there. Because once I say to them, but it's on Amazon and you can read it for free with a Kindle Unlimited subscription. Typically they say, oh, okay. It's been really right. good. And you're, and, and in full disclosure, you're not getting any, you're not necessarily getting any compensation for those people having their Kindle Unlimited subscription. You're just getting compensated solely for the number of pages that they read of your works, exactly. uh, more or less, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that was a huge shift in, I guess the the pricing slash compensation model for your for your business, I would imagine. It's been huge. It was really scary too, because like I said, I worked a really long time to market to those other platforms and to find those readers. Um, so to make the shift was scary. It's paying off so far. I'm still really leery of it though. I'm always leery of <laughs> putting all of my eggs in one basket scares me. Um, and that gives Amazon quite the, um, control. So mm -hmm. it's as a business person, it is a conundrum. Yeah. I mean, they're really the 10,000 pound gorilla in the space and it's hard not to, uh, you know, work with them in the way they want to work with you because otherwise you have to figure out a way to build that whole following on your own and do all the things that Amazon's doing for you behind the scenes, uh, without them which uh, they know is a challenge. That's why they can do what they can do. Yeah, exactly. So in 2025, you're going to host Books by the Lake in your hometown of uh, Whitefish, Montana. You know, what inspired you to now kind of branch off and, and host this type of event? I've hosted before, uh, but never in Montana. Um, really, so many people have said to me, my friends, writer friends and um, reader friends too, I would love to come to Montana. I'd love to come see where you live because it really is very beautiful up here. And uh, finally, I said, well, then I'm just going to host an event and everybody can come. I'll, it's like having 500 of my closest friends come for a party. Uh, so that's why I did it. I'm really excited. I hope you and Denise will come. Uh, I, I'm sure it's uh, on our short list once we figure out what our schedule is for 2025, because I like your readers. I am very interested in seeing Whitefish, Montana. What? So uh, it's def it's definitely one of those places that is on our list. So I am sure if we can make it happen, we will certainly be there. Now, for readers who may not be, you know, knowledgeable or have gone to events like this, what what can they expect? Well, our event is going to be smaller than, um, say, Book Bonanza that happens each year in Dallas. Um, my event will only have about thirty authors. And um, we're looking at between four and 500 readers. Uh, so it's a small, intimate event. What will happen is they'll, um, they'll arrive and 
Friday night, there'll be a welcome party. And then uh, Saturday is the signing. Um, it's an all day signing event. So all 30 authors, and then we'll have some narrators there and some other uh, vendors as well to sell like t-shirts and uh, mugs and all the things, all the bookish things. Um, right. It'll be an all day thing. And then um, they will get to go see their favorite authors and have things signed and photos and all of that good stuff. And then that evening there will be another party because hello, we're going to party. Um, sure. Yeah. It's going to be very simple. I'm not doing a lot of um, panels and things like that at this one. It's quite simple and small. Um, but from what I hear, I think people are ready to get back to smaller signings and uh, I'm excited mm -hmm. for it. There is no place in Whitefish, Montana that can hold 1300 people. There's just, um, we don't have an event space like that here. So we'll be small. Hey, listen, small doesn't mean bad. Small means great to me. I mean, if you have the right people and the right authors and the right people showing up, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it sounds like a great event and the location, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better one. So, yeah. uh, it sounds like it's going to probably be better some than some, even those larger events because larger does not mean better. So, like to uh, be. sounds fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, well, speaking of book signings, your husband, John, uh, proposed to you at a signing. He did. Yeah. So how has having a supportive spouse impacted your journey as a business owner and author? And, and I'll, I'll dovetail that with you uh, with the other question, which is what advice would you give to others on fostering a supportive partnership while navigating the demands of entrepreneurship because as you know or maybe not but our listeners know denise and i work very closely together she's part of our business uh she's our director of marketing and sometimes that's a challenge right and uh i'd like to hear your perspective it can be a challenge uh i couldn't do what i do without john to be honest uh he is so supportive um he gets excited with me about what we do in our business um, he actually formats all of my books to get them ready for publication. He travels with me to every event and he is my assistant there. And I actually went to Paris earlier this year for a book event and he wasn't able to go with me. And they assigned a lovely, a lovely volunteer to help me at the table. But the whole time I was like, where's John? <laughs> because we just <laughs> have such a great rapport and um, routine with each other. Um, so I have been in a relationship previously that he was not supportive of my job and he was quite actually jealous and um, quite mean about my success and it ruined our, we divorced. So um, because I wasn't willing to give up my company and um, he didn't like it. And so when I met John, I explained to him, this is what I do and I'm not changing it. It, it, this is who I am. And he was very excited about it. So, um, he having that person who understands, um, your job and understands the pressures that it puts on, on you, um, is really important. It doesn't mean that you have to work together in the same office, but I think that's part of love. Like, I think that's also what I write about. I'm just rambling now a little bit, but I write about the connection between people and that's part of love. I love you. I love all of you. And I'm here to support you, whether that's working together or not. Um, I think that's really important because it makes you feel validated as a human. So yeah, and if you're an entrepreneur and you have a spouse, <laughs> I just recommend <laughs> um, being very communicative, opening the lines of communication and talking about this is what I need or don't need. Um, and making sure that you're on the same page as far as your expectations financially, um, time wise, uh, because owning your own company is so demanding of your time that I think you can really lose balance. Um, so Communication is the key. Absolutely. Just make sure that everybody is okay. 
Great points. And I, I appreciate that. And I take that to heart too, because uh, I go through it every day. And, you know, I'm really sorry for the uh, first experience, but happy for you at the same time that you found John and, and his supportive nature. Because listen, you know, if you want to be successful, I, I think that, you know, it takes a team approach. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without Denise. Denise wouldn't be able to do what she does without me. So there is that partnership. And, you know, it sounds like you finally found that with John, which is which is fantastic. And it brings on other challenges. But at the same time, I, I feel it could be also far more rewarding because you're on the same page. You have similar schedules, you know. Uh, so it, it, there, are, there are a lot of positives to it as well. And it seems like you've been able to uh, find and navigate those for the two of you as well, which is which is great. Thanks. Um, so, so this one comes from your Facebook reader group, Proby's Peeps. Because and this is a Denise question. She asked me to put this in here uh, uh, because Denise asked them what you would like to ask, what they would like me to ask. And they want to know about your handbag collection, okay. which I know nothing about, but your readers want to know about. So I guess I will know about after this. OK, what was there something specific they wanted to know or they just want me to talk about my handbag collection? No, I guess there's some interest into what what is you know what's in the handbag collection. Nothing specific, but they want to know about it. It's uh, I guess it's a little unknown there. So, I really enjoy um, luxury handbags. Uh, I buy Chanel and Louis Vuitton and Fendi and all of the fashion fashion houses. I am quite addicted to handbags. Um, and I know my readership has known that for a long time. I used to give tours of the closet and then I stopped doing yeah. that because I started getting comments that weren't as nice. So I stopped giving those tours. But um, yeah, I do. And it used to be that whenever I, I published a book, I would buy myself a new handbag. Um, but that got expensive because I was publishing six to 10 books a year. And um, my husband was like, maybe not every time you publish a book. <laughs> um, so we don't do it quite that often anymore. But yeah, I have a really great closet. So what is your go-to and or most prized handbag? What What's the, what's the one? Um, <laughs> so my most prized, oh, I don't know if I should tell you. Um, my <laughs> prized handbag is an Hermes Birkin. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. I think Denise might be aspiring to your handbag collection. <laughs> just, just saying. But I will uh, say, um, first of all, I love Denise. She has been with me for twelve years. That woman has read everything. She is a wonderful human. But um, also, sometimes she will text me and say, "Look at this bag. Look at." And I love that she thinks of me when she buys a new bag or is shopping for a new bag. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we're we're not at the uh, the point where we have a closet for the bags yet, but uh, <laughs> we we might be on our way. Let's just say that. So I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, you know, listen. We talk about it all the time on this show. We're all about joy, and as long as you can plan for it, you can afford it, and it doesn't derail other things you're trying to do. If that's your outlet for finding joy, then hey, it's it's perfectly okay. Oh, perfectly I can okay. Agree. There you go. So listen, on the line of joy, we ask each of our guests the same final question, which is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? Um, you know, sometimes joy is really simple. And uh, for me this morning, it was just having coffee, uh, looking out my window at the mountains. It is my favorite part of the day. And it really does get me ready um, to tackle the rest of what I have to do that day. So it is my favorite way to start the day. I love that perspective. And I think if I had the mountains you had in your backyard in view, I would probably be doing the same thing. But uh, we don't yet. <laughs> at, or at least I should say at this point, we yeah. don't. But thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a great, uh, great perspective. So listen, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We're going to have all of your information in the show notes, Kristen, but if people want to connect with you, learn more about you, learn more about your writing, you know, what's the easiest and the best place for them to do that? Probably the easiest is my website, Kristen Um, and they can always reach me on, um, 
social media as well on Instagram um, or Facebook. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the day. Of course. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.